Welcome back into another edition of the KSO Show. Mason Voth, Derek Young from K-State Online with you as we get ready to put a bow on the Wildcats Big 12 opening win over the UCF Knights and also take a look at some of the story week storylines for this week, which is a bye week for K-State, not story weeks. I don't know that uh, we're going to have any of those anytime soon, but it is, uh, it is a good thing to start 1-0 in Big 12 play especially when you get a home game to start with it. I know that's a big deal. I think uh, the the number that I heard was like it's only the sixth time in the, the history of the Big 12. I think this is what Stan said on the radio at the end of the game. Sixth time in the history of the Big 12 uh, that K-State started conference play at home, which it doesn't matter in the grand scheme of things, but it is an odd quirk that K-State so often does seem to start on the road in Big 12 play. I think the last time – before this year that they had played at home to start Big 12 play was against mm, Baylor, and that was a, a while ago. So it's 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 something to take note of. It always seems like K-State starting on the road. They've had like three times in the last decade where they started on the road at Oklahoma. Weird deal. Uh, I'll, let me just – we'll start off with this little lighthearted conversation here. Uh, what do you make when people complain about K-State starting – conference play on the road every single year like i get that it's you know a weird coincidence it's like a, almost suspicious to an extent i get that but when you're going to have the same amount regardless like i i don't draw a whole lot of conclusions or conspiracy theories from it um in that regard like i, I don't know like i don't know that it's an advantage or a disadvantage i mean Folks say, you know, yeah. it's, an easy, it's, it's easier to win at home so you can get out and get the momentum. Maybe I don't buy a lot. I don't buy into it that much. I really don't. But what I will say is, like, it also makes other parts trickier, right? Now, it's not the same because these two teams are not what we expected them to be um, so far throughout the, through the season. Uh, I thought we thought Oklahoma State was probably a team on a downward trend. I don't think we expected the fall to be this significant. And obviously Texas Tech was, you know, anticipated to perhaps be a Big 12 title contender. And they're sitting here one and three. But because you did get a home game with UCF out the gate, now you have back-to-back -back trips after the bye week to Stillwater and Lubbock, which would typically be a pretty tall task. Yeah, uh, I'm looking through it. For sure in the last 12 years, only two Big 12 openers at home, Baylor in 2017 and Baylor in 2011. Uh, K-State won both of those games, so uh, something to, to take note of. So I'm uh, doing just some crack research right here yeah. as we get going. I didn't anticipate going this way to start the show, uh, but now that I'm, now that I'm in, I, I've got to kind of go right. through it. Now I will say one area that's kind of cheating, 2009, they started on a neutral field against Iowa State at Arrowhead. So, you know, kind of kind of counts, kind of doesn't. Yeah, no, I mean, it's an, it's an interesting layer of the schedule, certainly. Now, going back on what I just said, I still, like, some people may roll their eyes. I, I still think that road game in Lubbock is going to be pretty tricky. I would agree with that. I think, I, I think that's a game that, I mean, things can kind of change. Uh, yeah. You know, it's three weeks away, essentially, but – I think Tech is, Tech is going to be a team that's pretty fired up, and they are still a good team. Now, we'll see. You know, They lose their quarterback for the 20th year in a row uh, in a season, so maybe that changes things. But, uh, you know, Baron Morton showed some showed some flashes last year, I would say, and uh, obviously Joey McGuire knows what he's doing, or at least it has appeared that he has. So I, think, got, that, I, think, they'll, I think they'll be fighters. And they got two of the more ideal get-right games coming up, right? They get to play Houston and Baylor. Yes. Yeah, exactly. Uh, that I kind of, I kind of look at it this way. If they lose any one of those games, it's probably time to panic a little bit. Oh, where yeah. I, I start to change my mind on Texas tech where I go, okay, this isn't just like a weird thing. They just straight up aren't good and can't really handle this, but I don't know. We'll, we'll see. It's, it's going to be something to monitor. And now with the back of quarterback, so it becomes even yeah. more complicated. Now, I will say, like, they had the weirdest first four-game start of any team that I can remember in quite a while. So, like, the schedule makers did not, and which is themselves, partially, did not do themselves any, like, favors. Like, going to Wyoming out of the shoot is 
not not great because Wyoming is one of the better group of five teams so far, I would say, especially I thought their win over Appalachian State last week was actually pretty impressive. So you had to go there. That's very strange. You had to play Oregon, who might be one of the three best teams in the country at this point, if we're being completely honest and just use everyone's body of work. Yeah. And then your first conference game, you had to go clear to Morgantown. Like you've been on opposite sides of the country already this year, and now you're without your back of quarterback. Like they did not set themselves up for success from a scheduling standpoint. I know we're down a Texas Tech rabbit hole at this point. But, I mean, at this point, everything that could go wrong absolutely has. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right about that. All right, I completed my research. Thanks for buying me time there. Uh, five times since 1996 when the Big 12 fired up, K-State has opened Big 12 play at home. Obviously, 96 against Texas Tech, first Big 12 game ever. Uh, it was the first game of the season. Cats beat the Red Raiders in Manhattan. 98, they opened at home against Texas. And then 08, they beat Texas Tech. Uh, or I don't know. Actually, I guess I didn't check to see if they won in 08. I doubt they won that game in 08 against Tech. Uh, but they opened at home against Tech. They probably got their butts kicked. And then Baylor in 11 and 17, they opened at home. They did win those games. Can confirm those. Uh, so now that with the, the win against UCF, that made it the sixth time. So six times since 96, which what is that 27 years now? Uh, K state has opened only six times at home in 27 years of the big 12 conference. Kind of fishy. If you ask me. Yeah. Pretty fishy, uh, to confirm, um, uh, Kansas state did not win in 08. You were correct. They I lost, think it was bad. I think it was really bad. They lost 58 to 28. Yeah, honestly, they're probably lucky that Tech didn't score more uh, in that game because uh, that was that was the last year of Ron Prince against okay. like peak Mike Leach, Texas Tech. So yeah, uh, I bet a box score from that game would just be insane nostalgia to look back on and see what happened because I can only I can only imagine uh, what like Graham Harrell did to K State in that game. I mean, would I probably can, make some people you. really miserable. I can tell you, I have it right here. Okay. Game, Graham Harrell went 38 of 51 for 454 yards and six touchdowns. Okay. Yeah. yeah he did really bad things at K State. That uh, does not shock me. Uh, oh, oh, Taylor Potts. That's a name I remember. Uh, yeah. And Michael Crabtree, nine grabs, 107 yards, two touchdowns. So, yeah, that was, that's basically what I would have expected out of Texas Tech in that game. And is that Lamarck Brown with 25 carries, 64 yards? Yes, it is. I, you know what? Lamar Brown. yards to carry against a Mike Leach defense. <sighs> that's not very good. That is, <laughs> that's not very good there. I mean, you look at it, K-State didn't turn the ball over in the game all that Josh much. Freeman, you know? Josh Freeman did well, too, yeah. Yeah, good it day. was a, not, not fun. All right, let's, let's move on to some current Cats uh, because the Wildcats did take down UCF over the weekend. Things uh, much better this week in Wildcat land after uh, the loss to Missouri a week ago. K State bounces back with the forty-four to thirty-one victory over the Knights. Uh, Dwyer just start. I mean, we recapped it afterwards on Saturday. It's good to get the win. Good to be one and zero. And I mean, we just talked about Texas Tech struggles. This is a K State team that, even as they're playing right now, and seems like they might be, you know, a little bit behind where people thought they would be. They are still easily the second or third best team in the big 12, at least in my eyes. I know you, you see it a little bit differently, but not too far off. And this is a very muddied up league after you get past Texas. Yeah. I think I've got them at fourth, but I mean, after Texas, that next tier, I would include Kansas state with TCU, Oklahoma and KU. And I don't think there's a whole lot of differentiation between those four teams. Now it sucks to say that the Jayhawks are probably in that group, but they are deservingly so at this point. They they looked really bad against Nevada, but they were also manhandled Illinois for three quarters and just be BYU, who already has a win over SEC foe Arkansas. So Kansas deserves to be in that group, and they are undefeated. And I think what only one of three Big Twelve teams still undefeated, so it counts. Yeah. And um, that that's a good group over there, but. For me, it's like Kansas State probably has even more potential than Kansas and just hasn't got to that point. And we'll see if they ever do get to that point. I think they will. I think it's a good sign now that you're putting up similar numbers to the Oklahomas of the world, to the KUs of the world, 
and to the TCUs of the world when you might not even be as sharp as those three at this point, the way that you are playing. And that's not a criticism of Kansas State. It's actually probably a bit of an endorsement and a compliment. But Will Howard still missing on the deep throws. I, I think they had you know a double-digit amount of pass plays in the second half and only threw for, what, 60 yards in the second half, I want to say. So that's a really inefficient through the air in the second half. You really relied on DJ Giddens. So you feel good about the offense, but not great. And, and you're still left wanting a little bit more from a passing explosiveness, uh, you know, area. And still, you put up 44 points. You look at the advanced metrics when you bring in guys like their free mile rankings, Brian Freemouse, um, Bill Connolly's with the SP Plus. In Kansas State, I think they have them as the number 13 offense in the country, even though it feels like they're still working kinks out and it's a little herky-jerky at times. Defensively, it felt like they played a terrible game. It really did. And then you go back and reflect a little bit. UCF had the ball before the garbage score where Gus Malzahn did his rendition of Les Miles and Eli Drinkwitz. Before that, if you take away that possession, which I do, that was – essentially garbage time yeah it was it was 10 drives for 24 points that's 2.4 points a drive as a defense that's getting the job done at the end of the day it really is um even against the backup quarterback i mean so and then another way to look at it too is if you eliminate that final score which i from ucf which i think is everyone would say is fair to do because it was Mm -hmm. pretty much a meaningless possession UCF scored a touchdown with 13 minutes and 40 seconds left in the third quarter and did nothing after that. Nothing. So you feel like, oh, man, the defense had all these pull-your-hair-out plays, and in ways they did because of all the third and fourth and longs that UCF was able to convert on. But if you sit back and reflect and realize how many new starters that they're deploying and they're still doing this 2.4 points a drive, basically shutting down – a second power five team in the second half because they did it to Missouri too. Um, I think you got to take the good with the bad and feel pretty good about it, even though you know that they're a long ways from being where they, they can be. I would agree with that. I mean, I, I think it's the same type of deal, the Missouri game where there was a very slow start at one point in there, but the defense did eventually settle in, make enough plays, give you an opportunity and even though the offense almost did the exact same thing that they did in Columbia by not taking advantage of that opportunity, K-State at least got one more chance. They did take advantage of it against UCF. And a defense that is still inexperienced, still having to work at some things, they did kind of ease in and, and get some stuff figured out. So I, I do think that, that is actually an important thing to take note of. And we'll see now moving forward how everything uh, kind of looks uh, for, for K-State's defense. And they now get this bye week. To you know, let these guys that are young or inexperienced kind of sit back, talk a little bit, reflect on the first four games of the year, and see what comes out of it. And also, I mean, you look at the schedule now; like you come out of it with eat. You hate to use this word because, like, whatever, it's a conference game, the history of Oklahoma State. But you kind of get to ease yourself back into things by facing an opponent in Oklahoma State that isn't very good at throwing the football. Like, there's a reason why they were playing three quarterbacks up until they lost at Iowa state and that still wasn't like, you know, a great thing. They just picked one because it was Alan Bowman. So this is, this is a good spot for this K-State defense. And they, they've been better at times than what people would think. There's still a lot of room for improvement. And there are things that K-State is doing right now that against when they play Texas later in the year, if they are doing that against Texas, they are easily going to get beat. The special teams in defense, the way it is playing right now, Texas is going to beat them handily, and it's not going to be a game that K-State, I think, can be competitive in if they have some of these performances. But against everybody else in the Big 12 as of now, they are able to compete with them or be better than them. And the hope would be by the time that you do face Texas, you've built in enough time and experience to be better in some of these areas to where you are ready to go to Austin and actually go toe-to-toe with the team that you're likely going to play in a Big 12 rematch if you want to be in Arlington come the first weekend in December. So that's that's where I see things right now. Yeah, they're good enough to beat everyone else, but yeah, they got to pick it up a little bit to beat everyone else, probably get a little bit sharper, but there's a – and everybody has this problem. And people probably are get pissed off by hearing this because I 
sang their praises so much, and and obviously they're always prone to stubbing their toe. Uh-oh, there uh-oh. is a huge gap, and I don't think you would disagree. There is a huge freaking gap between Texas and any other team in the Big 12 right now. There is. Yeah, I would agree with that. I thought you were going to compliment KU somehow in there, and I was like, no, oh, no. no, I already did enough. I think yeah. I don't think there's a huge gap between K State and KU. No, as they're playing right now, I, I don't think so. I think that there can be still, um, yep. and I because I think K State still has the ability to be a very complete team. Yep. I just don't think that is there for KU right now. But we'll I see. don't either. I don't either. But if they played right now, I think it'd be a close game. Yeah, and I mean I, that's late in the year. I. I think that'll probably end up being like a night game on FS1 or something. That's going to be that is going to be a very fun environment this season. Yeah, I don't because it, it can't be a big noon kick. I don't think. I think that's already taken. But maybe. I don't know. Yeah, I'd have to. I'd have to look to see what the like next week, uh, next final week of the season is. I mean, obviously they'll be at Michigan, Ohio State the following week. But right. hey, it's never stopped Big Noon from going to Michigan Rutgers on you know. Big Noon or Indiana I mean, they, or Illinois I mean, or whatever to be honest, they do. Just yeah. anything to get Michigan on there. Yeah, well, they were just at Cincinnati last week. So. Yeah, yeah, that was – everybody talked about how week three there weren't any good games. You Week four, Big Noon was like, we, we have to go to Cincinnati, Oklahoma. <laughs> that's the game. It's like, man, I, re, I feel really bad for you that that's, uh, that, that's what you're dealing with here. Uh, let's let's take. There, a look there was here. plenty Final of other week. options. They didn't even have to do that. Um, Big Noon could go to Michigan, Maryland. Uh, Actually, Maryland's not bad. Uh, here's the thing. Like, I don't know if the if the Pac-12 would have some teams that are like, yeah, come do it. We'll play early games because like USC, UCLA is that weekend, and so is Washington, Oregon State. But outside of that, like there's, you know, there, I I think there would be a chance that that could be a thing. Um, yeah. So we'll have to we'll have to monitor that moving forward. See how it goes. Uh, okay, let's uh, let's move on with some other things from the K State UCF game. Um, we'll we'll do this by recapping our over unders that we did earlier in the week and uh, go over them. You got a leg up on Drew and I again uh, with your total turnovers over two and a half is what you took. Drew and I both took the under. K-State forced two turnovers in the game. First time that they uh, have been able to, to make that magic happen, at least against a meaningful opponent. And uh, so they get the two turnovers. UCF, they picked off Will Howard one time. So three in the game. Um, from the K-State perspective and forcing turnovers, what did you see this time out for the Wildcats that allowed them to take the ball away twice? Just Desmond Purnell making a play, right? Because the other one was uh... – Timmy McClain just throwing it right to Jacob Parrish, but not a receiver even in yes. the neighborhood of him. So, I mean, so what? Fan does a good job of this. Look, turnovers are turnovers. Some teams, it is a skill to an extent, but there's a lot of a, a lot of luck that comes with turnovers as well. Yeah. Uh, and, and then I on the will, I uh, get penalized too, because I also said it was an easy over. It was not an easy over. Yeah, you said not even close. Now, to be fair, the weather forecast did change a little bit on you. It, there was zero rain that had to be dealt with. Um, I was impressed that K-State did it. Honestly, I think, though, that the secondary could have been better in terms of, you know, making some more plays because you, if you watch the game, there were a lot of circumstances where Timmy McClain was forced to be running all over the place, throwing off a back foot, doing some really stupid things with the football, and he fluttered up some balls that – UCF caught a handful of times that K-State was in, you know, no man's land to try and get to. So uh, I think that that's an area where K-State could improve upon because we're starting to see better pressure. It's been a strength is that front. Now the, the, the DBs and everybody has to kind of step up. And when the opportunity is there, make sure that some guy doesn't sneak away from you to catch that butterfly ball that's coming their way. By the way, that dude is all entertainment all the time because yes. something crazy is going to happen, whether it's good for UCF or not. Is up for debate, but he is a flat out risk taker. Um, hard to bring down, hard to corral. Uh, that that was a chop. Would I stick with the turnovers? Final thought here. I'd like to see a, I'd like to see a game this year where Kansas State doesn't turn it over. Yeah, that would be good. Uh, I said it before the season started. Will Howard was going to throw more interceptions on a per game basis this year. That is happening. 
I did, I thought maybe that there would be a game that was clean though, but right now he's you know I guess he was clean against Semo, but he got away with some. But since then it's been at least he's had one interception in each I game. Did, in the last Semo, maybe he did, but the last two have been you know that thrown into traffic not very far down the field. Like that's also uh, the part that's maybe a little bit frustrating about it. So uh, be interesting to see if if they can do that. Obviously Oklahoma State. Probably a team you can do it against because any defense that gives up 34 to Iowa State, uh, they're not very good. So we'll just see what it looks like in Stillwater next week. Okay, you you got one on us, and you immediately gave it back. Players with a carry, three and a half. Drew and I took the over. You took the under. Uh, boy, it came down to the wire. But The fourth were... quarter to a receiver jet. I – I almost blitzed you guys on that one too. <laughs> that's uh, yeah, that's that's what I was expecting. This game was at some point one of the receivers was going to get a sweep, and sure enough, Philip Brooks a big two yard gain. I thought you guys went over because of Avery Johnson too, probably right. You didn't get yeah, one. yeah. No, I well, that's kind of my logic was. I think maybe one of the extra running backs gets a touch. But even if they don't, like Avery Johnson probably gets one or somebody. So I, I thought that there were a couple of ways that it could happen. Um, I said, whoever plays quarterback is one. And if Howard plays, then that number will be two. Uh, DJ Gins, of course, will get the lion's share of carries. And then I expect one of the backups to grab at least one touch. I would also expect a sweep or two to end up in the hands of a receiver for a carry. So I expected, I expected something like that to happen. You expected uh, five, according to that. Yeah, I mean, I did expect five in the game. I'll be honest, I did. Um, and honestly, I Anthony Frias, more touches than I thought he would get. I thought he would get one. He got two he, for eight he yards. Had, he, had, he had an unreal catch, actually. Yes, he did. Uh, he, yeah. he Look, he got in there. A little redemption from uh, the, the incident against Missouri last year. And that's that's no, like, small thing. It was very few touches. But for him to get in the game and, and you know, be solid enough, uh, it's going to give him probably a, a few more opportunities at times where they're they're at least trusting of him when a guy is nicked up or down, like we saw with Trayshawn Ward this week. No, he was legitimately pretty good. Yeah. All right, moving on. DJ getting scrimmage yards. Did he get over eighty-two and a half? Uh, <laughs> oh yes, he did, and we all took the over. Uh, on Clear, that one. Cleared it by two hundred. <laughs> yeah, uh, Drew. Drew could have just said DJ getting receiving yards. And we would have gone over the 82 and a half. Uh, if you've been living under a rock, DJ Giddens, 293 scrimmage yards in the game, four touchdowns, 207 of them came on the ground off of 30 carries. Then he caught eight balls for 86 yards. So, uh, yeah, a pretty good day for DJ Giddens. And conveniently does it right before Michael Bukanowski is going to make his college decision. <laughs> yes. Uh, yeah. Very, very, very true. Okay. Uh, other notes in this game. Looking through it, uh, we had the uh, let me find it real quick, the yardage longest play from scrimmage for K State 39 and a half yards. We all took the over in this one, uh, for K State in the game. Their longest play from scrimmage was 36 yards. It was a DJ Giddens run. I thought he might have gotten a cup because he had two over 30, I think. So I was like, yeah. you know what? I don't know how we did it, but great line, Drew. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, yes, we had um, we had a 36, a 31 from Giddens, and then a 31 from Will Howard for a touchdown. Well, um, really here's – those – yeah, those are – that's what you get. Here's the concerning part. Um, uh, well, here, let me find this. Uh, the receiving game only had five big plays categorized as 15-plus yard plays. And the longest passing play of the day was 24 yards. Uh, that was Will Howard to DJ Giddens. Um, that's certainly an area that is is a little bit of a cause for a con for concern right now, as the receivers aren't making the plays down the field. And the opportunity was there. Will Howard missed some throws on them. He missed Jane Jackson. He missed Garrett Oakley. Um, there was another one with Garrett Oakley yeah. that gets sacked on. Um, whether look, people are debating who's at fault for those. Whoever is at fault, they're not connecting. And that's part of the issue at, at the moment um, as well. And, and like you said, there was two of them, I think, that I remember that were fairly, I guess, intermediate is probably mm -hmm. a good way to put it, not necessarily huge. And those were to DJ Giddens, I think another one to Ben Sennett. And those involved actually yards after the catch too. So um, yeah. that even brings it back in. 
Now, I think the one, whether whoever, what, what I don't know, people can decide what the culprit was. But the one of Jaden Jackson probably would have hit that number had that connected. Yeah, and that one that one was tough because it was right there. Like Jaden Jackson made a heck of a play on the yeah. ball. I wonder if he got tugged Just, a little bit. Yeah. It probably did. I mean, the UCF got away with a couple throughout the game. There was that one play that was intended for Senate down the left sideline that he clearly just got pushed and ran out of bounds and no, no flag. Um, so there, there was definitely some of that. And we'll, we'll see how that looks moving forward. Uh, the last one, Kobe Savage tackles, five and a half. We all took the over. We were way off base. Kobe Savage only ended up with two tackles in the game. Um, you go and look at, at how the tackles ended up breaking down. Marky Siegel had the, the most out of the, the secondary guys with six, but Des Pernal led the way with seven. Austin Moore had six, no surprise there, and then everybody else was three or less. Um, you know, I guess the way to look at it is this, is there weren't many opportunities for the secondary to make tackles this week because either A, the guys up in front of them made the stop. I mean, you already talked about how awesome Des Purnell was in this game. Or B, the play was already way behind the secondary going for six. That's basically how things worked out for him uh, in uh, the week against UCF. Yeah, they Kleiman kind of directed some, I wouldn't say criticism, but part of the areas of need on defense kind of singled out the secondary a little bit. All right, let's uh, let's let's go on with this now. Some bye week storylines for the Wildcats. No game this week. It's early in the season. Uh, well, we'll start with this. This is your own little storyline. When is the best bye week? If you could pick a point in the season after game X, when would you want the bye week, or when would you think of that as being the best time for a bye week? Uh, probably near the middle, right? I would I would say that that would make the most sense. I don't know if exactly the middle, maybe because you play some cupcakes early too at times, mm -hmm. maybe like after week or after game seven, ideally. Yeah. But it probably probably changes from year to year because you 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 don't hate it right now if you're Kansas State either. Yeah, I I was gonna probably side with you on that. I think game seven is probably ideal. You get a little past the halfway point, but there's still enough of the season left that it's impactful. I feel like if you get past like game eight, you're going, why not Why not just finish this thing right now? This is kind of a nuisance. Uh, but yeah, depending on your situation, like K-State right now, this is a good time to have it. Based off guys being banged up, uh, you feel like you can get this and, and work some things out. Now, with the things that they need to work out, it can be injury-wise, it can be you know kind of getting guys on the same page or improving in certain areas. Uh, what is the number one thing that K-State needs to take care of in the bye week of something that actually can be fixed or adjusted in some way during the bye week? Not, you know, oh, well, they you know they need to go out and get like some 6'4 receiver that can haul in passes. That's not going to happen. That's not going to work. Uh, but what is something they can realistically do with this time off without playing a game? Yeah, I'll just simplify it. You get healthy and get better. Um, that's really what, you know, I wrote the story, but it, that's the gist of it all, even all four storylines. It all gets gets grouped into that. Get healthy. I mean, Ben Sinnott came into the media room after the last game with ice all draped over his shoulder. Will Howard was questionable. Jane Jackson and KT Levison got hurt during the game with cramps, so it's not long-term, and they'll, they're fine. But obviously they probably could use a little rest and recovery as well. Trayshawn Ward didn't play. He will be back. RJ Garcia played three snaps and then didn't play. He will be back. Trace Bivey, I think, was just sick. He'll be back. Christian Duffy and Garrett Oakley, a um, couple more weeks just to even get better. So they'll maybe they're you know clicking on all cylinders by the time they, they end up at Stillwater. And you hope the same is the, the case for guys like Keegan Johnson, guys like Jake Clifton. You're not getting Daniel Green back, <coughs> excuse me, but everyone else has a chance to be 100% or close to it, you would hope, especially Keegan Johnson. I mean, I – if there's one thing I'm intrigued about or I feel like we're getting, like, you know, screwed over, not getting to see is 100% Keegan Johnson. I think yeah. like, we're getting gypped on that. That's what it really feels like. So get healthy. And then I said, get better. You know, defense, fix the, the explosives, especially when it comes to the past defense. Like, fix those. Uh, climbing, alluded to it, being eye discipline. Like, fix it. Or – 
and make giant improvements, eliminate the seven times it happens and shrink it down and make it so it happens less, right? And then offensively, let's work on that passing game a little bit, like get those receivers going a little bit. And maybe getting healthy is really the remedy. We'll see, right? That could be it. So those are the areas maybe to focus on from an offensive standpoint, from a defensive standpoint. Obviously, you need to clean up special teams. That was really bad last Saturday against UCF at home. Um, usually when you're that bad on special teams, it can cost you a game. So they're fortunate that it didn't. And then another area to get better is maybe you can add a little wrinkle here and a little wrinkle there. Um, change, you know, Disguise your defensive looks a little bit more. Add in some more exotic pressures to the package or, or – you know, different looks on coverage, do a little thing different that maybe catches a team off guard later in the season. Offensively, maybe it's finding a better way to utilize Jaden Jackson because he's probably been your best blocker as a receiver. And he's certainly probably been the more most explosive, at least consistently, uh, receiver that they have. So maybe it's deploying more of him. Or maybe it's just getting Keegan Johnson back healthy and, and adding in that part of the offense that you've been unable to unlock so far. Um doing some double tight end stuff that we probably saw the first glimpses of last week between Garrett Oakley and Ben Sinnott. Um, you know, Will Howard obviously is your guy at quarterback, but maybe there's new different ways that they haven't really unloaded Avery Johnson yet because if you're really struggling from an explosive standpoint, he could be the, mm-hmm. uh, the anecdote for that too because I don't know if there's a better playmaker on the offensive side of the ball, even though he's just a true freshman. Yeah. Uh, one thing that, that will be interesting, uh, coming out of this is, is how K-State looks. They've obviously been really good to start games. They've scored a touchdown on the opening drive of all four games this season. They've moved the ball down quickly. And even though like, you know, you have a week in between, it's not like you're just going out and whatever, but you know, are they going to be able to start fast against Oklahoma state? Because realistically, this is a game right now, the way Oklahoma state is it's a Friday night, it's a road game, whatever. But K-State should still go down there and and handle Oklahoma State. So do they put the screws to them early? Like, we're going to have to wait to see if they do that. Uh, One interesting note, and this doesn't have to do with what they can do to get better during the bye week, uh, but Chris Kleiman has played seven games in the regular season after a week off. K-State is three and four in those games. Uh, Last year, they lost at TCU. The year prior, they lost to Iowa State after a bye week. And then 2020, they uh, had three games after off weekends. They beat Oklahoma, they beat Kansas, and they lost to Iowa State. Those obviously, whatever, you know, the COVID year. Uh, And then 2019, they lost at Oklahoma State, and then they beat TCU. So stuff that we have that is is notable, but it probably doesn't matter in any way, shape, or form. Uh, Because honestly, like K-State coming off of the bye week last week, they played awesome at TCU. I mean, or last year, they played awesome at TCU. And yep. uh, if it's not for injuries to a quarterback, two of them, and, you know, Chris Tennant missing some kicks, K-State easily wins that game, I think, or at least gives them the chance to win it. So, Yeah, no, that's fair. I was going to say, in fairness, if, if I wanted to defend some of those four losses, I mean, they're playing some really good teams, too. They're, yeah. <laughs> I mean, as bad as it sounded, I mean, Iowa State, and plus 2020 had a lost to Iowa State. That was the ugly one, 45-0. Mm-hmm. Maybe Iowa State. Yes, the bull champs, DY. Yeah, maybe Iowa State twenty twenty one. Maybe that one probably isn't. As, that one as, hurts because that was what Brees Hall first play of the game, like yeah, seventy yeah. yard touchdown. Yeah, yeah, yeah they were not but, ready for Brees Hall. A couple of those are pretty good TCU teams. Mm-hmm. Uh, that Oklahoma State team was really good too. So yeah, yeah. So just uh, something to take stock of with uh, the bye week and everything else. Uh, anything else in in this bye week that you know has your attention? You're you're locked in on and uh, want to kind of take note of before we get out of here. Just around the Big Twelve, probably. I mean, I think for a myriad of reasons, but Kansas at Texas is interesting mm-hmm. because yeah. I think that could be a, a hard dose of reality for Kansas, typically. But Texas never covers the week before the Red River shootout. So Kansas is also getting them at a good time. Yeah, good point. Uh, real quick, there's a look at the scores from week four if you're watching on the YouTube from uh, the Big 12. Uh, anything from this past week stand out to you, catch your attention with how things went down? Uh, maybe Probably West Virginia, Texas Tech is the is the only real shock yeah, with how it went. 
I'll give thoughts on each one. You keep those up there because I don't have them in front of me. Yeah, yeah, I won't let you forget here. <laughs> yeah, TCU's win over SMU I think is quietly very impressive. I mean, SMU is no cupcake, and I thought the Frogs pretty much manhandled them. Um, that was one of the better performances of the week. The same can be said for West Virginia. Like I said, Texas Tech season a little bit on fire, so we'll see what if they can respond and get to two inferior opponents that are next on the schedule. But a one and three start, and now you're without your starting quarterback for the rest of the year. Uh, kind of a disaster, doomsday for the Red Raiders. Kansas, I know that I mean beating BYU by double digits. That's impressive. Um, not quite as impressive, in my opinion, as to what TCU did, uh, but pretty close to it. Oklahoma, a two touchdown win in Cincinnati. Look, you'll take a road win any way you can get it, but I thought the Sooners were very unimpressive. And I believe the Bearcats had four red zone trips that they didn't even come away with points. Yeah. So that one is a lot closer than the score may even indicate. It was only a two touchdown win to begin with. Oklahoma State, Iowa State surprisingly turned into a shootout. I expected an Iowa State win, but not 34 to 27. Not sure it says much about either team, but. The Cyclones are better this year than the Cowboys, and I thought that was at least manifested itself there. Interesting that Houston beat Sam Houston by 31. I'm not sure I expected the margin to be that wide. Remember, BYU only beat Sam Houston by 14. So not that the transitive property is ever a perfect you know, comparison, but uh, you know that's, that's what we got. K-State, again, a shootout. Um, some good things, some – inconsistent things, but if you, you're walking away, you essentially won 44-24. It, it's hard to be mad about that. And, look, I expected Texas to smack Baylor on the road, but for them to go out and actually do it is another thing. So uh, hats off to the Longhorns for not losing focus and, and just taking care of business. If, if they can do that week in and week out, they're, they're not going to have that many close games on their schedule, including the Red River shootout. Um, Texas can, can blast the Sooners again if, if they bring their A game. Yeah, I mean, do I dare start to give Houston credit again for beating a bad <laughs> opponent? Uh, no, I won't do that. But it is it is interesting that BYU only beat Sam Houston 14-3 to uh, in Provo, and then Houston does that to him. I don't think it means much. That was the first game of the season for BYU. Uh, their, their win over Arkansas trumps that, which is why, you know, the KU win is impressive. Um, but, you know, the Jayhawks get – they get they got one defensive score right off the bat. I mean, that – that is a play. If if you have not seen the Kobe Bryant hit, that then he scoops up for a fumble recovery and then takes it for a touchdown. This is an incredible hit. Like I'm still mesmerized by it. I I tweeted about it and I, it was a compliment. And I had KU fans replying to the tweet like going after me. I'm I'm like, dude, I am saying something nice about your team right now. Like I I'm legitimately impressed by what I saw there. Uh, that KU defense is still really bad. It took them to get those some turnovers to avoid giving up even more. Th- there are holes to be exploited there, and they haven't even played a team that I think has a good offense yet. Uh, so it will be interesting to see what Texas does to KU this week because not only ha- does Texas have the, the passing game right now where Ewers looks better, he has the receiving threats. It does start to seem like Texas has maybe got the run game figured out a little bit. Like, I would start to maybe, you know, pay attention to that because early in the year it seemed a little bit scary not having B. John Robinson or Roshan Johnson. But now you look at what's gone on the last two games. Jonathan Brooks has gone over 100 yards in both of those games, um, and now he's averaging almost six yards a carry this season. So Texas now has everything really starting to come together on offense, and we know that their defense has been really good to start the year. I was going to say, this is why the Longhorns are super good and why we're talking them up and people are probably annoyed by us talking it up because we know that Quinn Ewers has had a pretty good start, seems to be a little bit under control and more managing the situation more effectively this season so far. And you just talked up the running game. And I was going to say, at this point, they might have a top five defense in the country. Yeah. Nope, they're really good. Uh, They are the real deal this year. And that's why it is uh, up to the curse of Texas to uh, go on strong and actually, uh, you know, rear its ugly head for them at some point. We'll see if it's this weekend against KU. And I will say I'm not I'm, – I'm convinced about Texas's team in the parts, in the sum of the parts, I am convinced. But when you lack a fantastic head coach, you are susceptible to letdowns. Yeah. 
and I think they lack a fantastic head coach. So where is the letdown? Because it mm -hmm. could still happen. Yep, I'm with you. Uh, I am not a Steve Sarkeesian believer, uh, but right now he at least he does he gets enough props for the way that they started. So that will do it for us later in the week. We'll have more thoughts on the Big 12 this weekend, and also uh, Dy and Drew will join me later in the week. We'll go over our Big 12 power rankings uh, a third of the way through the season, kind of explain ourselves a little bit more and our stance on those, and then uh, be sure to stay tuned because in between all of that. Coming out tomorrow, if you're watching or listening to this on Tuesday when it drops, D.Y. and I will have a recap of what Chris Kleiman had to say, break down some of the important things from his press conference this week because he's the only Wildcat we're going to hear from during the bye week uh, because there is uh, no game on Saturday, no players this week, no coordinators this week. And actually, we're going to probably end up going two weeks without talking to the coordinators because it's a Friday game next week. So We, we get them on Wednesday. Oh, how about that? Moving them up. Moving them up the day. That's going to be a good time. Back-to-back -back days for everybody. So, hallelujah, we get to hear from Chris, uh, Colin Klein and Joe Klanderman, uh, two guys I do like to hear from. Everybody know If you've been following along ever since uh, this staff came to Manhattan on my K-Man days, I'm a big Joe Klanderman guy. So, he just needs, he just needs his defense to play a little bit better right now. Uh, he's got he's got some things to clean up. He could he could tighten some things up too. Not, it's not just his secondary. I think he's got a little learning curve. He's adjusting too. So uh, that will do it for Dy and I. Be sure to uh, make sure you are locked into everything we have going on on our YouTube and podcast channels. And then also you got to be a part of a, of everything we got going on at K State Online with on three great stories on recruiting the team, and then obviously everybody's favorite the message boards where uh, each and every week. You get to tell me what I did wrong on player grades. I love it. That's what it's there for. It's to drive engagement. And uh, look, uh, I, we got to have some nuance in this. What I've learned with the player grades is uh, you can start to figure out which guys have certain vendettas against certain people. And I'm sure by reading uh, my player grades, you go, oh, you really don't like this group of guys. And you do like this group. You're probably right. So uh, be sure to get over there. And if you're not signed up, you can be. And then you can bitch and moan all you want about my player grades to me. And we'll see where that goes for everybody. So for Derek Young, I'm Mason Voth. Thanks for watching and listening to K-State Online.